Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome George Washington University President Stephen Knapp. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Knapp, President of George Washington University, and it's a delight to welcome you for this afternoon's important discussion of the future of Homeland Security. It's also a particular honor to welcome Secretary Janet Napolitano and former Secretaries Michael Chertoff and Tom Ridge back to our campus. Here at George Washington, we have a unique opportunity to engage the world from this nation's capital and to enable our students to witness the power of knowledge in action. One of the ways we do so is by convening discussions of the urgent issues of our time. And our ability to do that depends on, in many ways, on our partnerships with the institutions and the agencies that surround us. We're very glad to have as one of those partners the United States Department of Homeland Security, which has long supported a range of policy, research, and educational efforts across our university. George Washington's Homeland Security Policy Institute leads much of our work in this critical area. We offer training programs for first responders and graduate programs in the fields of cybersecurity, emergency management, and security policy. In fact, the university hosts an array of security-related initiatives spearheaded by entities as diverse as the Elliott School of International Affairs and the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Today, we'll have the opportunity to learn firsthand from an exceptionally distinguished panel. I look forward to hearing their insights into the homeland security environment looking forward. I'm also delighted to note that our alumnus, Admiral Thad Allen, retired commandant of the United States Coast Guard, former National Incident Commander for the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, and now a professor in our Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Administration will moderate this afternoon's discussion. Before hearing from Secretaries Napolitano, Chertoff and Ridge, and Admiral Allen, we'll first hear from our hosts, Frank Salufo, Director of our Homeland Security Policy Institute, and Mark Pearl, President and CEO of the Homeland Security and Defense Business Council. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Frank Salufo. Thank you, Dr. Knapp, and let me echo your welcome to everyone today. Uh, it is a distinct, distinct privilege to be able to co-host today's session. As I was uh, in, in the, the room out back, I, I literally saw a decade of my life collide simultaneously. Um, I, I mean, you don't get better public servants than the three that are uh, joining us today. And um, uh, I've had the privilege to, to work with all of them. We've had the privilege to host all of them in the past, but never simultaneously. So I know uh, I certainly am uh, excited to hear what they all have to say. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. And let me also thank uh, our co-host, Mark Pearl. Uh, he's done yeoman's work in uh, trying to translate the, the nouns into verbs in terms of public-private partnerships. And uh, delighted to work with him. And of course, our friend Admiral Allen. So thank you all, and uh, look forward to this. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, uh, and particularly the Homeland Security Policy Institute here at GW, President Knapp, and everyone in the GW family uh, for helping us put together an important and what we think is going to be an exciting program. This is the second in the Homeland Security and Defense Business Council's National Conversation Series that is trying to look forward to uh, how we can continue together to build the structures, the processes, the systems needed to have the smartest, most successful homeland security possible. While the phrase, this is the most critical time in our nation's history, is overly used, this truly is a pivotal time in our nation's history. We are at the crossroads of a perfect, not necessarily welcome, confluence of a global economic, social, and political dynamism that will not only have an impact on the infrastructure of our nation, but will test on how we proactively rather than reactively tackle the issues that bring us together today. We need to look closely at what the government's role and responsibility can be in preventing, preparing for, responding to, and being resilient in the face of a major catastrophic event, whether it by terrorism or by nature. While what we do and what has been created and nurtured since 9-11, including Katrina, H1N1, Abdullah Matulab, who in fact his trial begins today, Times Square, Fort Hood, printer cartridges, tsunamis, oil spills, and the decimation of Al-Qaeda in just the past 10 years 
is still an evolving work in progress. Industry, particularly those that provide the Homeland Security technology, services, and product solutions, is ready, willing, and able to work even more collaboratively with government going forward. Our goal is to enter into a fruitful, substantive, and ongoing dialogue focusing on working together to achieve mission success. The Council's March National Conversation at the American Red Cross, which featured the FEMA Administrator and the head of the American Red Cross, focused on preparedness and resilience. Today, on this GW campus, in front of an audience of experts, I might add, in their own right, we have asked four individuals who have long since graduated from DHS 101 to help us tackle the issues surrounding the evolving homeland security, homeland defense landscape under a new normal of politics and policy. What will and what should be the framework going forward? The council calls it a 2020 homeland security vision, combining the need for clarity and exploring what the world must look like in homeland security in the year 2020. One housekeeping announcement. We have provided you with cards that you can write down a question when we open up the floor to questions. I urge you to pass them to the outside. Uh, if you think of a question during our conversation, we'll pick them up and get them to our moderator. Speaking of our moderator, there are a few individuals, as President Knapp mentioned, in our nations who understand as much as Admiral Thad William Allen the true meaning of how to successfully operationalize homeland security. And what better person to moderate this distinguished assemblage of public service and expertise? His capstone of his career and being the Commandant of the Coast Guard that started in June, when he started in the Coast Guard in June of 1971, was, as everyone well knows, being the principal federal officer in the Gulf in 2005 and then being called down to that region again in 2010 to become the National Incident Commander of the Deepwater Horizon spill. A Times article referred to his appointment to lead the oil spill response, said it simply and to the point. Allen's candor and, and candor and competence brought an aura of calm to the crisis. But long before his face was splashed across our TV sets on a daily basis, or twice over the past six years, he had already given so much to our nation. He led the modernization, the first modernization of the Coast Guard since World War II. And while he has multiple honorary degrees, uh, he also got his bachelor's in science and engineering from the Coast Guard Academy, his MPA from this very school, the George Washington University, and his master's of science. And so in order to bring an order, some order and calm, and to help us in our mission today to lay out the next decade rather than just look back, I'm excited to turn the proceedings over to an individual who has worked closely with and under all three of our DHS secretaries, Admiral Thad Allen. Thank you, Mark, for that very interesting introduction. Uh, the panel here really needs no introduction. Uh, I, I told them backstage I was not going to read lengthy bios, but I would like to make a couple of comments because I have had the great fortune and the great honor uh, to work personally with uh, these three great leaders. And I think a, a couple of comments uh, probably are appropriate before we start our discussion here today. And I'll start with Secretary Ridge, who gave up the autonomy of being a chief executive in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, to come forward when the president asked him to be the first uh, Homeland Security Advisor. And I remember when the president signed the legislation on the 25th of November uh, 2002 to establish the department. Uh, that was done between sessions of Congress and midterm elections with a 60-day mandate to stand up the department, which had to be uh, placed into effect on the 24th of January with the new agencies coming over on the 1st of March. And I remember seeing uh, Secretary Ridge for the first time in a Dilbert-like cubicle at 18th and G. And uh, we walked over with the Coast Guard warrant officer, and we gave him a travel card, and he was the department. So thank yeah, you for being here, sir. <laughs> Army of one. <laughs> <coughs> uh, Secretary Chertoff uh, left the uh, safe confines of being a federal judge and risked it all by coming back to Washington, and we're glad he did that. Uh, prior to my intimate uh, relationship with him during uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, he launched a major review of the department based on the feedback he had gotten from Secretary Ridge and the experience of the first couple of years. Uh, we looked at the border and transportation security under Secretariat to see if that was the right format by which to take a look at border security. And he launched the uh, second stage review 
which was an attempt to take a look at what I would call the Department uh, 2.0, and then dealing with the significant challenges associated with uh, uh, the legislation, legislative mandates following Hurricane Katrina, especially with the revised role of uh, FEMA and national preparedness. Uh, somebody I, I dealt with on a daily basis and with the President during Hurricane Katrina, somebody I have immense respect for, Secretary Chertoff. Thank you for being here, sir. <laughs> In uh, December of 2008, after the elections and before the inauguration, uh, I was home uh, visiting my parents in uh, Tucson, Arizona. I thought it would behoove me uh, to go to Phoenix and meet my governor, at that time Janet Napolitano. Uh, we had the opportunity to get to know each other in a very uh, uh, good conversation without a lot of distractions around, uh, paved the way for a relationship that extended past the inauguration. Uh, and into her first, uh, first years as the Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, we have uh, experienced uh, some of the same types of uh, external pressures related to events that uh, you don't always predict that Secretary Chertoff and I have. I've always appreciated her forthrightness. Uh, I was always grateful she was my governor, and I was very proud to serve her secretary. So thank you for being here. Thank you. The general goal of tonight's discussion, and we really want it to be a discussion and encourage the interchange between our, our secretaries that are here, is to start off with a couple, just a couple of comments about where the department is right now. There have been a lot of retrospectives on the department since it was formed when the agencies came over in uh, March of uh, 2003. Uh, we've been through the first quadrennial Homeland Security Review, uh, and we've had certainly sufficient oversight by Congress. I think we would all agree. I, uh, I would concur. What I'd like uh, each of the secretaries to do is comment a little bit on what I would call the DHS enterprise. This is a term that's kind of taken form over the last 24 months, partially as a result of the first Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, that tries to take a look at not only the department's role in terms of function, where it's at in mission in relation to the original statutory mandates that were contained in the Homeland Security Act and some of the follow-on policy of documents such as uh, HSPD-5, Homeland Security President Directive 5. Uh, and take a look at the broader issues that are confronting uh, the homeland right now uh, in relation to not only what the department does, but the role of individuals, the communities, uh, the private <coughs> sector, academia, our national lab. <coughs> and the goal from uh, that starting point after we had that initial discussion is to walk through some current issues, incurring the, including the current and developing threat environment. Uh, some of the challenges that are laid out before us structurally in governing, in governing uh, incidents right now related to interagency coordination and cooperation, and more specifically, uh, how the Department and the Homeland Security Enterprise interacts with the Department of Defense, particularly in, in defense support to civilian authorities. There's been a, uh, some significant action taking place over the last two years through the Council of Governors, and I hope we can uh, talk about that. And then I think we'd like to have the secretaries kind of give us their thoughts on the uh, evolving uh, threat environment. As it was so well summarized in the opening remarks, we moved away from a monolithic Al Qaeda. We have dealt with homegrown terror plots. Uh, we are looking at all hazards and all threats as coming under the purview of the department, including uh, germs, weather, oil, uh, whatever can cross state boundaries and create a national challenge, are pretty much on the plate of the Homeland Security enterprise uh, moving forward. And then, following that, I'd like to start focusing in on the relationship between the department and our, and our private sector partners. Uh, the Homeland Security and, and Defense Business Council has done a great job in laying out, I, since, I think, the essential elements of where we were at and what has happened, not only to the nation, uh, but to the Homeland Security enterprise. But I think the questions that are left open that we'd like to kind of zero in at the end of this are, are the things that we can do together. And not only because the private sector owns so much critical infrastructure, has such a lead role to play uh, in cybersecurity, and having the means of production to solve a lot of problems that don't reside inside the government, but also how do we solve the really complex problems that generate requirements that are well beyond the capacity of one individual organization in government to solve. And we've just had some very, very sensitive uh, oversight activities, at least in my tenure as Commandant, regarding the role of systems integrators. And I think some conversation about how we need to collectively move forward uh, with the whole of government response to solve uh, hard, complex problems uh, will be worthy of some discussion. And then finally, uh, just some comments on public-private partnerships. And I think that term is probably overused as much as some of the others that were talked about earlier today. I think we probably need to move away from, uh, from some general euphemisms like that and talk about what's really important in dealing with the private sector. And we we'll look forward to your comments on that. 
So with that as a general overview or a, or a way forward, uh, let me first ask the Secretary Ridge to make a couple of comments about that day on the 24th of January when you walked into your uh, office at 18th and G and just a couple of thoughts you have on the uh, DHS enterprise moving forward. Well, as you know, we grew from that uh, one individual to about 180,000. I think we're up to 220, 225. Almost 240. Now. 240. All right. Um, well, I'm glad we got them down the border, by the way, so congratulations. <laughs> That's where you need them, by the way. Uh, real quick, if I might be able to set the stage for my colleagues, uh, I think it's really important for the discussion, or at least for your potential frame of reference for all of you, is to view DHS really as a holding company. And on that day that uh, we were assigned the responsibility to integrate uh, people from about 20 plus different agencies and 180,000 people at the time, you had mergers, you had acquisitions, you had startups, and you had divestitures, uh, all going on at the same time. And unlike the private sector, we didn't have like a year and a half to do it. Uh, I was sworn in on the 24th. By the way, the National Security Council showed up a couple of days before March 1st and said, uh, uh, we're going to go into Iraq in a couple of weeks. So as you're setting up the department, you ought to try to build an infrastructure in case there's some blowback uh, for terrorists. Uh, I said, OK, not a problem. We'll do it. Um, so if you take that frame of reference and, and you think about the following things. Um, first of all, uh, there were four, four, uh, four, a couple principles that we tried to embed, and I think my colleagues have basically done the same thing, and they really build upon it. Uh, because the first thing you know is that initial structure, you're going to have changes. And I think uh, one thing that the three of us have demonstrated is that the, the openness to change and the need, just like the private sector, if it's a holding company, for continuous improvement. The first iteration, the second iteration, the third iteration. The threat warning system is a great example. It initially started with Ashcroft, Ridge, and Mueller going out saying, be alert, be aware, have a good day. Then we went to the color-coded system. Secretary Napolitano said, look, we're going to downsize a little bit. We're going to do it differently because public messaging is a critical, critical feature of the Homeland Security piece. Uh, the second iteration, uh, Secretary Chertoff took a look at that structure that was created and supported by the administration, took a look at past experience the previous two and a half years, and said, no, I think there are other ways that we need to integrate some of these resources. A couple of quick thoughts. Homeland Security is a national mission. It's a federal agency, uh, but uh, you really, one of its biggest job is to integrate its capability with states, locals, academic, and the private sector. I think we all agree on that. One of the principles I think we all agreed as well is you push your border out as far as you can. You want to secure, you, you want to make sure the goods are secure, you want to get as much information about people who come into the states where they're getting on a boat, flying on an airplane. So it's a national mission. You push your border out as far as you can. One of the biggest challenges we have, and my colleagues can, can comment on this, was we also need a new culture. Because if America is the battleground, a culture of information sharing, the Cold War culture was the need to know. For Homeland Security to be most effective, it needs to share. Not only needs to share horizontally within the federal government, but down to the states and the locals and the police chiefs and the like. That was a real challenge for us. I presume it's gotten better, but frankly, as I take a look at a couple of the things that have happened over the past year, I still think there's plenty of room for improvement. And while you're doing the business line integration, and that's everybody had their own IT, everybody had their own procurement, well, people had different budget modalities, every HR differences, I think we've proven pretty well that we can execute the game plan in terms of policy, but remember, I think this agency is subjected to more political scrutiny and pressure. The incident of the moment sometimes drives change, not necessarily the change we, we, would, necess we would necessarily agree to. And then finally, our challenge was at that time, and I believe my colleagues have followed up very successfully, you do all these things consistent with the American brand. You do it consistent with the rule of law. You do it consistent with the Constitution of the United States. So remember, we start off as a big holding company. And then you embed in your mind there needs to be continuous improvement every step along the way. And I think my colleagues have demonstrated not only their desire to do so, but their ability to execute on improvement. Secretary Chertoff. <clears throat> well, first, let me say, I mean, I, w I was really lucky in, uh, when I stepped into the job a little uh, after two years after the uh, birth of the department because Tom had done a phenomenal job of standing up the basic framework and the foundation from scratch. Um, that's not to say it was completely mature. It's still probably not completely mature. And by way of reference, if you go back to the Department of Defense, I think most people would argue that between the Department of Defense uh, being uh, established in 1947 and Goldwater Nichols uh, that came considerably afterwards uh, was a tremendous amount of maturation that took place. 
which most recently, I think, gave us the, the tremendous success against uh, Osama bin Laden in May of this year. So I, we understood there was a lot of work to be done, but we had a great foundation. I would say that the, the, you know, from a high altitude standpoint, there were three basic challenges. One was to get within the department a culture of jointness, shared understanding of the mission, and shared execution of the mission, which is part of any organization, and particularly important when you're bringing in constituents from a lot of, a lot of different agencies, some of which were, had varying degrees of enthusiasm about being put into a large <laughs> agency. Uh, you know, um, you can guess which ones liked mild. it and which ones didn't like it. So there was that element. Second element was the vertical element. How do you coordinate with state and local governments in the private sector? Uh, again, probably more than any other cabinet department, and certainly more than the other security departments, DOD and Justice. Uh, at the very heart of DHS's mission was having a robust relationship <clears throat> with state and local government and the private sector. And a lot of the challenge there is in the fact that there is not a command and control relationship that operates on a vertical basis. Uh, in fact, I used to get asked all the time, I'm sure Tom did, I'm sure Janet is, who's in charge? And the answer is in many cases there isn't any one person in charge. Even the president's authority uh, when it comes to matters that occur domestically within a state or locality is limited. And the governor's authority may be limited. So you really learn it's a different culture. It's a culture of coordination and how do you maximize uh, teamwork. I used to say to people, you know, basically it's like a baseball team. We might be the manager, but the manager's not out in the field while play is going on saying to the shortstop, throw the ball to the first baseman and saying to the third baseman, cover the shortstop's position. What you're doing is you're training and establishing the plays up front and then you're allowing the team to take the field and use that information to operate in a coordinated fashion. So that was, that was a second challenge. A third challenge was dealing with a set of expectations that people have about Homeland Security. The concept of Homeland Security was a new concept. Uh, we had, you know, I grew up in a world where the uh, Defense Department and the Justice Department had completely separate and distinct <clears throat> um, areas of authority to deal with security threats. You basically looked at a security issue, and if it was a, uh, a denominated a military issue, a matter of war making, then you had a set of entities that dealt with it, a set of authorities, and a set of legal rules and processes. If it was a criminal issue, it was law enforcement, it was a different group of people, different set of authorities, different set of laws. And uh, there was very little overlap. What Homeland Security um, as a doctrine uh, was forced to grow up with is a world which does not fit into those categories. It's a world in which we're often using all of these tools to deal with threats. And which tools we use vary in particular situations. So you know, we can have a, uh, someone like bin Laden who was both an indicted defendant, but was also somebody that was a military target. And the need to bring together a department that embodies a new doctrine and one that spans uh, what used to fall very neatly within the jurisdiction of different federal organizations, I think was a challenge in and of itself. And I think one of the things that we went through with you know, Admiral Allen was to try to build a strategy and a doctrine that takes account of a very, very different menu of threats, one in which you can be dealing with uh, medical threats, <clears throat> biological threats, natural disasters, uh, transnational criminal groups, smuggling, border security, and terrorism, and sometimes the line is not very clear about where one ends and the other one begins. So these were, I guess, the next stage of building after the basic framework uh, laid out by Tom. And uh, I, I am happy to say I do believe we matured the department over four years, certainly had some bumps in the road, and I think that process has continued. Thank you, sir. Um, Generally, when there's a uh, transition of authority in this country and we have a presidential transition, if there's a party that's been out of power, there's usually a cadre of folks or a cohort that is in academia or business in consulting or someplace, and they're kind of waiting for their turn should that happen again. Uh, the transition uh, between the Bush administration and the Obama administration was the first transition to a new party where that cohort did not exist uh, outside in those different areas. 
Uh, Secretary Napolitano, as we move into the discussion of the enterprise and maybe the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, maybe you could comment on uh, the challenges associated with uh, a party coming in that didn't have the alumni group already out there. Well, yeah, and, and first of all, uh, Sad, you were a marvelous colleague to have, and, and we went through some fairly large matters together and you provided great <coughs> leadership and counsel to me and I, I think to my predecessor so I want to just say a thank you for that. Um, and I was also very lucky in my two predecessors because uh, I knew uh, Governor Ridge a little bit. I knew uh, uh, Mike from uh, our, our days as former U.S. attorneys. Um, so we had some, some prior knowledge. Um, and we did have a challenge in front of us. Why? Because this department, so new, it's never had uh, a transition before. It had to be designed out of whole cloth. Uh, uh, Mike designed it. Uh, his uh, department or the department uh, executed it. Um, but I began to get a glimmer of what I had gotten myself into uh, when these people started arriving in Phoenix, where I was still serving as the governor, with, uh, with dollies full of three-inch binders of things that uh, I needed to uh, uh, absorb, and more acronyms than you could possibly name. And, and uh, they finally gave me a, a glossary of the acronyms, and it was 94 single-space pages. I'm pleased to say now, three years after the fact, I know virtually every acronym that was on that list, <laughs> which, which is a little scary in and of itself. Um, but it, it has been and continues to be a process of, of building and maturing and adapting. Uh, building, the department still coming together as what we call one DHS with some, some items that are, are common culture, common expectations, common business practices uh, among the different uh, agencies, uh, adaptation uh, of deciding what initiatives we need to pursue uh, and looking at them from a variety of angles. A, a question can involve uh, issues uh, that uh, implicate the Coast Guard and Customs and ICE and uh, FEMA and the Office of Health Affairs and the Science and Technology Directorate. Uh, the national uh, or the, the NPPD directorate. So taking a look back and using all the tools of the department uh, to adapt and deal with new and emerging threats. Uh, and then uh, uh, continuing to uh, identify uh, what the threats are out there that are, that are real. I mean, there's lots of speculative threats and we, we all do some of the what if, what if, what if. Uh, but there's enough intel that crosses our desk on a daily basis that teaches us uh, really what we, our adversaries uh, are or may be thinking about uh, technologies or other capacities they really do have at their command and what do we need to do to en enlarge or maximize our ability to prevent uh, something from occurring and then our ability to respond and recover as quickly as possible. Uh, so those things all are happening simultaneously. Um, lastly, um, I think one of the things that has gone on, you know, the Department of Homeland Security has been the largest reorganization of the federal government since the creation of the Department of Defense. It's been immense, and I think it's not till you're in it that you realize how immense it, it actually is. But um, as that reorganization has occurred, uh, it impacts uh, other participants in the, in the so-called interagency because, for example, uh, the Department of Homeland Security actually has a huge international footprint and we're actually negotiating uh, international agreements all the time. Uh, and we, we have uh, people stationed in 75 countries around the world today. Uh, and so uh, uh, ha that culture, which is relatively post 9-11 where home secretaries, ministers of the interior, homeland security secretaries have their own international pathways, communiques, and um, relationships. That is a new and evolving set of international uh, relationships that I think will only grow more robust as time goes on. Uh, conversely, uh, now we have the, the situation where as the Department of Homeland Security uh, matures and uh, 
the, there's a greater realization about its roles, its responsibilities, its statutory mandates. That means adjustments in other members of the federal family as well. It can be DOD, it can be the State Department, it can be the Justice Department, it can be members of the intel community, um, but uh, all of those departments now uh, are uh, having to make changes in, in a good way, but in a good way that uh, really works uh, with DHS so that assets are leveraged uh, one with the other appropriately. I think that's still a process of adaptation that's underway. Uh, can I make a quick observation here to, to the Secretary's credit? Uh, and it's still the transition because we, I remember calling uh, Secretary Napolitano the night before she was going to be announced, you know, that everybody, and I was in Europe and I said, I'm, I'm going to take the liberty of speaking to my successor, uh, Secretary Chertoff. There's only two people in Washington that know what you're getting into. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the range of challenges, the complexity. I mean, there's really only two people that know it all. Well, maybe our deputies as well. But I said, I think you need to be, feel very comfortable calling us both. The Secretary's credit, from time to time, we get calls and a heads up, this is what we're doing that will affect the change. And we get calls to say, what do you think about it? So and that whole transition continues. And it's, 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 it's far beyond uh, the, 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 uh, what I think most people would normally associate with going from one administration to the next. If I could extend the discussion just a little bit further, and the thing I'm going to do right off the top is take the budget discussion out of this. You know, it's an axe looming over everybody's head, but I think, and we had this discussion backstage, we've had this discussion for a number of years in Washington, uh, across the board cuts in the, in the words of uh, Secretary Robert Gates, uh, perpetuate mediocrity. Uh, there has to be a better way to have the discussion about risk that's being assumed and trade-offs that have to be taken in the context of the evolving Homeland Security enterprise and the points that you all have made about the evolution of the department. If you can maybe add what you think is uh, in germane right now in the evolving threat environment and what are the types of criteria or things we need to be focusing on as we're all going to be entering a constrained budget environment and have to make tough choices. Mm -hmm. Those ought to be informed <coughs> choices that are made based on our best understanding of the threats, vulnerabilities, and risks that are out there, and, and uh, having, having the ability to have that, to, that conversation separate from some kind of a mandatory budget level, I think is really, really important. And ma'am, I think we'll start with you on this one. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> li listen, one of the things that, that has changed is, uh, as the department was building, uh, it, it was, uh, and reasonably so, getting big budget increases every year as its needs became more manifest and the like. So if you actually trace the, the uh, appropriations process involving the department, you know, you'd get a 6% increase a year. I think some years it was actually 7% over the prior year. Uh, and we're not in that environment now. I mean, we are in the environment of either uh, something equating to a freeze or uh, a, point, a percentage point or two below that. Uh, or even in some scenarios, you know, f five, five percentage uh, uh, points below that. So uh, it has put a premium on really evaluating every activity that we do and how can we do it more cheaply and effectively. Uh, it, it has meant really, I think, uh, getting uh, control over our acquisitions uh, process. Uh, and, and I wanted to point that out because I know some of you in the audience are interested in this, but uh, really uh, making sure that we're not uh, sending good money after bad. Uh, when we've tried something for a long enough time, so you either get a sense that you've got something or you don't. Um, but making hard decisions about when to cut expenditures off so that we can conserve resources for other activities. Uh, it means that uh, we uh, really need to look at what is the right mix uh, uh, manpower to technology, um, and are there, there are some things in, in the hopper, technologically speaking, that will be force multipliers um, for our, our manpower, um, even though that may be down the road, so it, it continues to make sense uh, to invest there. Um, and then, uh, again, this whole business of the enterprise, you know, the sharing with the state, the local, the private sector, nonprofits. Part of that is because Homeland Security is uh, not, not neatly described in an organizational <coughs> box. It, it does involve a lot of things, but part of it is because you need to be able to, to uh, share, share the division of responsibilities, uh, share the work. 
um, so that everybody uh, isn't doing all the same thing all the time, but you're actually uh, doing, uh, and, and sometimes this is unintentional as well as intentional, but really what you're trying to aim for is a mix so that everyone's uh, budget is used to its maximum effectiveness. This is a, that is a very complicated process because when you go through your own department's appropriations and budget uh, process, it doesn't necessarily take into account impacts uh, of, of others who may be in the enterprise. How we grow and, and acknowledge that aspect, that complication, uh, I think is still ahead of us. <clears throat> I, you know, I think that's very true. And first of all, I'd like to say I completely agree with you, Thad, that the idea of an across-the-board cut um, is a way of doing everything in a half-baked fashion. Um, what you decide you ought to do, uh, you should do well. What you decide it's not worth doing well, you shouldn't do at all. And, and where I saw this in Homeland Security during my tenure was we were in a period of rising budgets, and there was a real tendency for everybody to feel the federal government ought to pay for all the security. And why aren't you covering that? And why aren't you doing that? And in some ways, to a degree, and I, I want to be careful to say to a degree, a period of budget austerity can actually be a good thing uh, from the standpoint of the department because it allows you to say no to people. Right. You know, in the, it, when I was there, if you said to members of Congress, we don't think we should do that, that's not a federal responsibility, they'd say, what's the matter with you? You don't believe in protecting the country. Now, there's actually maybe a more powerful response, which is we can't afford to do it. We've got a limited budget. We've got to make choices. So I, I, it can be a healthy environment. That being said, what is required is to think about not just what are the core missions of the department, but where are the best um, locations for the various level of responsibilities. There are a host of things that can be done on a security standpoint quite well at the state and local level. And uh, those ought to be done at the state and local level, and they perhaps ought not to be done by federal agents or by feder with federal money. Now, I understand that at the state and local level, they've got a budget issue, and this is the moment when they say, we need more help from Washington. But w what I would suggest to the people who have their hands on the, on the fiscal uh, pipeline is it ought not to be about who screams the loudest. It ought to be about something that I think all three of us have been committed to, which is to look at the risks, figure out what is the right level of investment to manage, not eliminate, but manage the risk, and most important, who is best situated to actually execute on that risk mitigation. Sometimes it's the private sector, and sometimes you have to say to the private sector, we can give you information, but we're not going to give you money. So, you know, there can be a, a, a useful exercise here, provided that it doesn't get overwhelmed by the tendency of a lot of loud voices to, to overwhelm the decision-making process. Secretary Ridge, um, you've been out there in the marketplace of ideas. You do consulting. You have your own firm. I know you also do some work with state and local governments. Right. Having been a, a governor, can you maybe give us the point <laughs> counterpoint to that on how you would counsel the state and local authorities to respond to that? Well, first of all, it's, it's, I think we all agree that one of the challenges within Homeland Security, frankly, is to get the people on the Hill, the political class, to know that Homeland Security is about risk management, not risk elimination, because there's, you just can't eliminate all risks. So you have to prioritize the risks internally, and as both secretaries have said, and then under the austerity measures that we have now, prioritize. And then determine not only what the risks are, but who's best situated to deal with the risk. When uh, I was governor, you used to walk in my budget secretary's office and you'd see a sign, it was unavoidable. You'd, before you talked to him, you saw a sign says, Nothing stimulates the imagination like a budget cut. <laughs> now think about that. You have the dollars right now, presently. Uh, I think Secretary would say you're probably beefed up in terms of the m muscular manpower, woman power. I mean, you've got personnel. So as you're thinking about these very austere and difficult times, you really, I mean, the burden will be on the department. And again, they're going to get pushed back from the Hill. That's what you need to understand, that these, this is where we believe we need the resources, and it's going to be a real battle for the secretary and her team once they've made those difficult decisions on a case-by-case uh, -case basis to preserve the funding in those areas. You need to understand that. I think uh, Secretary Chertoff's notion about uh, identifying who's best <coughs> equipped to deal with certain elements of the risk 
some of this needs to devolve back down to the state and locals. That's always been, you know, part of it's a certain bias I have as governor. You can't secure the country from inside the bloody beltway. And you, know what? you have to start trusting not only the state and locals, you've got to start trusting the private sector. So I think you need to do an assignment and perhaps reassign some of the responsibilities. Whether or not you send the money remains to be seen. Depends what other responsibilities you have. I also think they need, in these budget times, you've got to go back to the enabling legislation, and it's called COTS. You need commercial off-the-shelf technology. No more Petri dishes. No more experimental technology. There's a lot of stuff out there that could be embedded if you believe in risk management. Somebody may come in with a bright-eyed idea, we can eliminate all the risk. Well, if show me it's done it someplace else. Manage the risk here. And then finally, I think uh, the technology is probably the place that there's going to be some, uh, some additional revenue, perhaps not in the overall budget line, but if you're going to be focusing it, it needs to be on technology. And I know this is going to really upset some of the contractors in the room. You might have to take a haircut. Okay? You may have to take a haircut. Professional services during the past couple of years in dealing with governments and one another over the past couple of years has reduced their fees a little bit. You may have to take a haircut. I hope you don't mind, Secretary, but I thought I'd throw it out there for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, this is really getting interesting. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe the, the next uh, evolution in this conversation might be to pick out a couple of, uh, of technologies related to th problems we know exist out there and then try and talk about how you get to a solution. And sometimes it'll be a policy solution with state and local government, but sooner or later we're gonna to have to translate these into requirements, actually put out a solicitation and actually acquire things that once we've decided they are important. Uh, and when we think about some of the changes in technology that are going on with uh, virtualization and cloud computing, our ability to deal with large unstructured data sets and some of the analytics associated with that, maybe you could opine for us on some of the very difficult problems that might be susceptible more to a private sector solution and a discussion how we might want to move forward on that just <clears> in the current threat environment. And I'll start in the middle this time with Secretary. Well, Trump. you know, I mean, it, it, we could talk about this in a lot of different contexts. I spent a fair amount of time on the issue of cybersecurity. I did when I was Secretary, I do now in my consulting as well. And I thought for a while, I mean, there's a, there's a challenge in cybersecurity in that most of the assets are in private hands. And uh, we're dealing with, um, an area where there's a lot of sensitivity because we're talking about how people communicate with each other. There are countries in the world where the model is to have the government sit on the internet and control everything that goes back and forth. Of course, their agenda is not security in the way we think about it. It's a different kind of security. But um, it suggests to me that the model of having the government sit on the internet and watch everything that goes back and forth and intervene to prevent bad things from happening is probably not gonna receive um, a hospitable reception in the United States. That being said, the government does have uh, an incredible set of capabilities that are valuable and important. So to me, this is a great example of where the private sector has a place to go. Uh, the, the ability to create trusted agencies or entities in the private sector that have the capability of working with enterprises in the private sector on security, know how to work with the government, are able to handle classified information so they can interface with the government on, in terms of sensitive information, but actually wind up executing with private set of hands on the controls. And this creates the kind of a dispersion of power that reduces the risk that a government's going to abuse uh, its position on the internet. And yet, because you have people who live in that world, they have an opportunity to see what's going on in a way that makes them more capable of managing network security than a company that's in another business and only really sees what comes into its own in domain. So that's just one example of a, of a place where I think the private sector actually has a lot of capability, not necessarily to sell to the government, but to sell to other parts of the private sector, but to work with the government in producing that result. Madam Secretary. <coughs> well, when, when, you, when you think about um, cyber and, and, and that whole evolving area, first of all, in terms of homeland security, it's probably the most rapidly evolving area. Um, and it's, you know, it's an area where there are no international rules, really. There's no you know, legal framework on which to, to hang things, um, where uh, things, uh, uh, by their very nature, cross national boundaries all the time. 
Uh, we know the internet is, uh, is a, an accelerant of certain types of recruitment activities. Um, there's good to it, there's bad to it. We know there are attacks on us on the internet. We know that uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, economic uh, assets of the country that are, that are, that are being stolen uh, via the internet. So there's just a, a lot of work uh, that needs to happen in this arena. We also know that 85% or so of the nation's critical infrastructure uh, is uh, in private sector hands and is uh, dependent on a cyber network of some sort or another. Uh, and so one of the, the things that is, and, and one of the more interesting things I think is going to happen in Congress now is they are going to be taking up legislation uh, to, to try to at least define some roles and responsibilities and, and statutory jurisdiction, primarily the division between what is in the Department of Defense and what is in the Department of Homeland Security. And the, the basic issue that I think defines the, the, the different, the two major bills that are pending is to what uh, degree the private sector will be mandated to do certain things, to what degree they will be, quote, incentivized to do certain things, or thirdly, to what degree, well, we just assume that the market will, will somehow take care of, uh, of, a, of an issue or a problem. And, and that, that issue, as it will be encapsulated in the debate on cyber legislation, really will go to, in the, sec in the security arena, to what degree do we think the private sector has incorporated security concepts as part of their own core competencies uh, that they will uh, take on voluntarily, or to what degree, because they do control uh, critical infrastructure that everyone is dependent on, uh, is there a governmental interest that needs to be taken more strongly into account? So uh, this all underway right now. Quick thought about my, <clears throat> you know, I, <clears throat> when I think of cyber uh, security, I think of two issues, attribution and accountability. Uh, technology is pretty good now. We're getting we're generally able and we'll be able to, time to, to attribute an attack to a particular source. Uh, but I'm very skeptical that the global community is going to come into some accountability standards. If you do this to us, these are the penalties you play. Now, maybe that'll happen in time, but I think we need to do everything possible to make sure that they don't gain access. So we need to worry about accountability. And I think as the Secretary pointed out, Secretary Churchill pointed out, if there's a space, if there's an area, if there's a dimension within which it's a sine qua non, you absolutely need the public-private sector partnership. This is it. To the point where I think uh, that the Congress and uh, the executive branch should look at their regulations that really inhibit the ability of the private sector to come in and sit and work closely with the immensely talented people we have in the government sector but they still don't have the breadth and the depth, in my judgment, that is available throughout the digital community in the United States. So I think both secretaries have hit on something that's critically, that it may be the highest priority. I mean, by the way, the private sector's backbone is the government's backbone. If the electric grid goes down, federal government suffers. Financial institutions, I mean, so it's there. And so this is a classic, I mean, if there's one spot, one place, one dimension where that public-private sector relationship for national security reasons is absolutely imperative. This is it. Uh, just a comment. I had the opportunity uh, several weeks ago to have an extended conversation with uh, Anish Chopra, the chief technical officer who works for John Holdren, the science advisor to the president. And he, he postulated that there was an opportunity to have a public conversation uh, with some leading CIOs from the private sector and the folks that are having to grapple with these problems inside government and he, he, he longed for a metaphorical Switzerland where you could go and sit down and say, what are the, what are the rules that are inhibiting us? Yep. You know, what do we want to do with FISMA? What does it really do in terms of the regulatory requirements that it's placing on the private sector? Uh, and he kind of longed for a way to have that discussion and a set of principles that would come out of that that could govern the way forward. So let, let me just ask you all, because let's crank right. it down and get, and get to the really hard part. <clears throat> I, I think there's a consensus on this stage right now, on this particular issue, what needs to be done. The real issue is when we have uh, a Congress that hasn't been reformed pursuant to the 9-11 recommendations, we deal with the tyranny of the present that we've all talked about, 
Uh, how do you constructively move this thing forward, Madam Secretary? Well, I think, um, uh, first of all, uh, I think we begin with uh, the President's review of uh, cybersecurity from how to organize the government itself, because realize the government itself has all kinds of overlapping jurisdictions and, and responsibilities. And, uh, when you really, you know, boil it down to, it's that the DOD will have responsibility on, in the .mil universe, and DHS <coughs> will have responsibility in the .gov universe, and primary responsibility for the intersection with uh, the private sector. Uh, and, and DOJ and other agencies have equities <coughs> in there, but the, the basic division is, is there. Uh, then the question is, well, who gets to use the NSA, the greatest technological resource the, the country has? Uh, are we going to build two NSAs, one for civilian, one for military? Or are you going to somehow figure out how both, uh, both streams can utilize that resource? I think uh, Secretary Gates and I were able to negotiate a, an MOU that basically uh, identified how a civilian agency can tap into uh, and use the NSA. Uh, but it, 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 that is, in and of itself, an evolving relationship. Uh, and so we, we see those things. And then you get to Thad's question, which is, well, how, how do you bring the private sector to bear, all those CIOs and, and what have you? Quite frankly, I, I, don't, I don't see uh, the lack of a metaphorical uh, Switzerland. I think the, a key question is who gets, who gets to come? Uh, you know, every, at some point when you say, here's our metaphorical Switzerland, everybody's going to raise their hand and say, well, I should be there, I should be there, I should be there. Um, and, and, and so I think what we need to do is uh, uh, not only just uh, be working with critical infrastructure players, uh, but again, be thinking about moving forward. Um, what is it that we need to have as an end product? Do we need to have as an end product a regime, for example, where financial institutions must tell you, must tell the department when they've had an intrusion, something that many are reluctant to do right now. Um, do we have a regime where we uh, can create some kind of intellectual lockboxes where information can be uh, deposited and anonymized so that it can be exchanged in some fashion? Well, how, how do we do that? Uh, what things are so critical and so impactful that government mandates really are uh, the most appropriate way to ensure the public safety. Those questions, I think, are, are still not answered. These are things that, that um, are all going to be debated in the context of legislation, but, uh, you know, even afterwards, I suspect. Secretary. You know, I, 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 uh, <clears throat> this is a, a really a challenging area because there are, it's not one problem. There are a whole set of problems. And frankly, the problems are of different levels of, of consequence. Uh, they present themselves in different ways and they have different solutions. I think we're well past the point that people believe there's one magic bullet to solve this issue. We're talking about sometimes f what, what's called cyber fraud, which to be honest is really pretty much the same as fraud we've seen in the past you know, uh, against people uh, you know, for financial purposes, where there are some technical issues, but frankly it's not terribly different from what we've seen before. There's the theft of intellectual property on a massive scale. Some of it uh, for criminal purposes, some of it by nation states or by competitors. There is concern about attacks, denial of service attacks. There are concern about uh, malware that could be used to uh, technically disrupt or destroy critical systems, including um, control systems. These are different problems. The consequences are different. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all bad, but some of them are worse than others. Some of them implicate interests that are largely private. Some of them ha are implicate uh, uh, consequences that would have huge public effect. Some of them probably can be dealt with from a market standpoint because people want to protect their own assets. Some of them, because of the collateral consequences, are, are uh, areas of market failure because a company is not going to invest more than the value of the asset it's protecting to protect the asset. And yet, in many cases, the failure of the asset will have a huge impact that is external to the enterprise itself. So to me, what you do is you look at all this stuff. And then you figure out, what is your doctrine? How do you treat the different kinds of threats? What do you view as principally private sector? What do you view as, as principally public concern? And then what's the role of the government versus private sector or, or 
quasi-governmental agencies in dealing with these issues. Uh, and that requires some hard choices. When do we regard uh, a, an attack as an act of war? When do we regard it as something that's not an act of war? Once you've put your doctrine to the <coughs> which I think is a very uh, laborious and challenging intellectual process, then I think it's possible to look at the total set of tools we have, incentives, information sharing uh, rules, mandates and regulations in some circumstances, and perhaps direct government action in others, and we can overlay those on what our doctrine is and decide who is best situated to carry out uh, the mission of dealing with that particular challenge. The one thing I would say is this. It's been my experience in however many years I've been in and out of government. Um, and I can say this because um, I used to be a judge, so I can trash lawyers. The biggest problem <laughs> is the lawyers. Because I find the lawyers <coughs> often come into a problem set with the concept that here's what the law is, here's what the authorities are. You've got to figure out how to make this work within that construct. I would argue something different. I would say, take the Constitution. That is the boundary. That is the one thing that is immutable that restricts you. Within that, everything else is a matter of statute or regulation. Those things can be changed. We ought to put together a doctrine and a strategy that is based on a, a serious policy decision about the optimal way to deal with these challenges. Once we have agreed on that, then Congress ought to make the laws fit what we think the doctrine and the strategy ought to be, rather than try to fit the doctrine and the strategy into a set of legal rules that were actually built in the 20th century before we, we really had a robust internet. So that's my one big uh, suggestion for how we go about this process. What would you add to the blueprint, sir? Just, well, just a couple of things. One, it's a skepticism that Congress will move as fast as the technology. Uh, <laughs> well founded. I don't know why I'm skeptical about that, but I just have a feeling, and, and that's why I think it's even more important uh, for the kind of collaboration that my colleagues have talked about between uh, uh, the uh, private sector and uh, uh, government itself. Uh, secondly, I, I suspect, given the fact that uh, you have invested as taxpayers billions of dollars into cyber research across the board, that there are probably some capabilities uh, and some digital capabilities that for national defense and security reasons can't be shared publicly. I mean, I suspect that's true. I don't know it to be true, and I'd have to understand that, because just as Homeland Security is about risk management, in terms of national security, there's a level of risk management. And the capability that NSA or DOD or somebody else may require in order to protect certain risks that they say may be great in the private sector, but frankly, once it's out in the public domain, then it's accessible to our enemies. And so you're going to have to assess those capabilities internally. Uh, so. Uh, so it's incumbent, therefore, I think, so if you're as skeptical as I am, that Congress will move with the agility and the foresight as quickly as technology. It's not a criticism. It's just a fact. They move at glacial-like speed. Technology is changing every day. Uh, you accept the notion that there are some risk and probably some digital capabilities within the government that will never see the light of day until, unless they can go to 3.0 and then share 2.0. And then finally, I think the final word is trust. Uh, I, I like the notion of a Switzerland. And my judgment is not who you invite in. I think everybody has to have a seat at the table. At some point in time, it's, and I go back to the battle we had early on in Homeland Security, you have to create a culture of sharing info. And there's always a reluctance to share with the governors or share with the big city mayors or share with the police chiefs. Well, if you can't trust Americans to secure American, who are you going to trust? And if you can't trust the digital private sector to come in as patriots, is men and women who want to help the government deal with uh, the threats of uh, sovereign incursion, uh, organized crime, uh, and all the, the long list of people, given the ubiquity of the Internet. We know we're being attacked from multiple sources, multiple times, for multiple reasons. And who can you trust? So I really think, again, I'll just put an exclamation point on what my colleagues have said. This is the place to have the kind of really, really robust uh, collaboration between the public and the private sector. If I could maybe roll that back to some of the original conversations we had when we started the panel this evening um, and kind of put that in the context of the DHS enterprise and the larger effort that we're trying to do nationally and what a whole of government response would be to this. Uh, I worked several issues uh, while I was a commonal, particularly as the chairman of the interdiction committee working for the drug czar on information sharing and trying to 
migrate some of the technologies that have been successfully used inside NSA to the southwest border to be able to take advantage of pattern recognition and some of the, uh, and some of the cloud computing. And for those in the room uh, who are not military by background, uh, the J6 in a joint command is the CIO or the person responsible for the IT security and those types of issues. And I remember sitting around the table and talking with everybody saying, I wish there was a cosmic J6 that could step up and actually provide some oversight or structure or be the convener or lead the conversation. So I guess let me go back one more time and say in the context of the evolution of the Homeland Security enterprise, uh, is there a logical role or a broader role or a more uh, clearly defined role for Homeland Security? And is there a limit to that role if we're going to move across boundaries in some of the areas we've talked about? How do you actually construct a model where if you, want, if you had the right people at the table, you could actually convene that meeting? Madam Secretary? Well, uh, I mean, that, that's a hard question because it's, it, it, you know, it posits or it, it will be different in different environments in a sense. You know, cyber is perhaps a mo the more challenging environment of, of all. Why? Because it's so new. And we're still, I, I think, even beginning to get our arms around what the definition of the problem is, uh, much less uh, who participates and, and how. Um, but I do think in terms of some of the actual operational responsibilities of, of the department, the kind of the day in, day out, bread and butter, you know, border security, transportation security, uh, uh, the, the uh, making sure that um, we know who's coming in the country, we, may, we know uh, what, what, what is being delivered in, into the country, um, that, that there, there are opportunities for public-private partnerships that are very uh, robust, uh, and, and where there is an alignment of interests and resources, that, that is quite good. And one of the examples I would give is in, in what's going on now, in terms of uh, uh, the global supply chain and securing the global supply chain. Uh, and, and that began from the, from, from the institution uh, of, of the initiative as being one of public and private uh, together, trying to figure out who does what, and all under the auspices of the Secretary of Homeland Se Security as the convener. Why? Uh, because uh, that person uh, stands as uh, the person who has the greatest visibility into all aspects of a particular problem. Governance on a larger scale, sir? Uh, well, again, moving beyond the issue of cyber. <clears throat> again, the challenge is that, uh, and I think this is where DHS, because it's really a 21st century creation, has an opportunity to model itself in a different way. It's all about networks now, and that means you don't control things, but you cooperate with things and you uh, work together in a collaborative way. That sounds a little too new agey, but um, if you think about it practically, uh, even the president doesn't have the power to control uh, the uh, state and local government or the private sector as President Truman learned in the steel seizure cases. So how do you get everybody working together? Um, and I think one of the things we developed over a period of time at THS is a recognition that part of how you do that is you get people together to plan to identify the problem jointly, to plan jointly, to train jointly, and to exercise jointly. And that gives you a running start into how things work. I'll give you a, a, a concrete example. In 2008, we had a couple of hurricanes, <clears throat> one in Louisiana, Gustav, and one in, in Galveston, uh, which was Hurricane Ike. And because after Katrina is part of the reform, we spent a lot of time and effort <clears throat> doing detailed planning with state and local government in the Gulf, including doing things like a census of everybody in nursing homes and very detailed evacuation plans and backup plans for buses. And Thad will remember a lot of this, uh, having been part of it. When Hurricane Gustav hit, or was about to hit, we had the capability to literally evacuate everybody from New Orleans who needed to be evacuated, including something like 35,000 people who were in hospitals who at the last minute uh, the administrators believed had to be moved. And that was a consequence not of the fact that all of a sudden the president had the power to order uh, the state and locals to do things, but that the joint planning and training paid off in terms of cooperation. So to me, part of the governance issue for the Homeland Security Enterprise is about 
using collaboration and coordination as tools to move a lot of different independent bodies playing off the same sheet of music uh, and producing uh, a unified tune. Sir, I'll just make a comment, and this is my own observation just watching from my television at home. I thought the uh, performance of the uh, local governments and the governors during Hurricane Irene as that uh, hurricane came up the coast yeah. with an indication of the maturation of what the state believes their role are and acted proactively in advance of the event. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just uh, finally add a couple of thoughts. You know, I think at the end of the day, we ought to start with, and I, if we handed out cards, I'd like you all to give me your definition of cybersecurity. <coughs> I don't think it'll be unanimous. So I think uh, in this, in, in this Switz Switzerland, it could be a DHS, it could be the White House, uh, why don't we bring uh, the practitioners from the grid, from uh, financial services, uh, from uh, manufacturing base, the critical base, et cetera, and DOD and uh, NSA and everybody and say, all right, based on experience, uh, what do you see the greatest threats? Is it, is it access? Is it encryption? What is it that, uh, and I, I would suspect out of a, a meeting like that, and DHS, since DHS is basically overseeing the private sector, anyhow, not a bad place to start. And then from that uh, convening, and then you could probably hand out the task and assignment. I'm a strong believer, as Secretary Chertoff is and Secretary Palmer is, once you've identified the problem, task somebody to it and then come back. But I, it's fascinating that, I mean, I've, I've asked this question rhetorically many, many times, and depending on where you are and the problems you have encountered and what you look at over the horizon, you probably come up with a different set of priorities. So as a country, we need to build on those priorities. It's just it's risk management. And then based on what we collectively agree that the priorities are, then we might go out and find individual capabilities within the private sector that could help build uh, and respond to whatever those risks we see truly exist in the digital world. Thank you. Just to remind everybody, um we are taking questions from the audience. If you filled out one of the cards, if you could pass them to the outside, uh, they'll be collected. And I do have one to, to post to the panel here. Uh, and given your extensive political backgrounds, I'll throw this one to you. Uh, we'll start with uh, Secretary Chertoff. Uh, does divided government ne neg negatively impact our national security? <clears throat> Boy, that's like a huge question. You know, I think the answer to that is actually no. I mean, I'm, I'm a believer in, in the system that we have, which I think works well, but it has certain challenges, unlike a system they have like in Great Britain or Canada where someone comes in and has, essentially, they're given the reins of power. If they have a majority in Parliament, they can pretty much take it uh, as far as they can during the term until they're voted out. I think our system works well for us. Um, it does create certain challenges. That being said, I think there's actually a surprising degree of, of agreement across party lines on the kind of core requirements of security. Now, that doesn't always get manifest in what you uh, read or see on the media, where uh, the media tends to gravitate, sorry to those reporters in the room, tends to gravitate to people at the extremes. But I think at a working level, um, it does actually uh, reflect the reality. The challenge we have is not a challenge of divided government, it's a challenge of willpower. You do have to make decisions. They're going to be unpopular. I remember when we did the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative, which requires uh, a much more secure document to cross the land border with Canada than was the case prior to 9-11. Um, you know, the 9-11 Commission recommended it. It was passed into legislation. Um, we began the process of making that transition. There were some members of Congress from the border districts that were adamantly opposed to it because they felt it was going to hurt the economics of the local communities. In our view, it was necessary to protect the country and uh, to protect not just those districts, but those that were in the interior, which might very well feel the brunt of an attack if someone snuck across from Canada. And uh, you know, there was a, a concerted effort to, to push back. Uh, we got it you know, sub a substantial way down the road, and then Secretary Napolitano picked up the baton and she got across the finish line. To me, that was a great example of willpower. There was a consensus view. Uh, it didn't matter where one was a Republican, one was a Democrat. But you had to be willing to take a certain amount of flack to make it happen. And you know, you, this is a broader comment than maybe about security. In the end, there comes a point you've got to look at your, and I'm the, I'm the non-politician here. I've never run for office and never will. You've got to be able to look yourself in the mirror and say, what am I here for? 
if I'm here to, if I'm here just to occupy a position, that's one thing. But if I'm here to do a job, and I figured out what the priorities are, then I've got to make the decisions and drive the result, even if it's going to wind up with a certain amount of personal unpopularity and a certain amount of unpleasantness. So that's, to me, what the solution is. Secretary Ridge? Well, if we're going to talk about uh, national security or foreign policy, uh, that involves uh, critiquing uh, some of the things that are going on, and we're not here to do that, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, I think it's important, uh, however, from if you're talking about national security vis-a-vis -vis homeland security and the role that the department is playing and how it is playing out in the international arena with our, our, our friends and allies, um, I would say, and I would like to be very interested in Secretary uh, Napolitano's sense, but one of the first things we did was try to convince the State Department that we ought to have a presence there, thanks to Secretary Chertoff and Secretary Napolitano. We now have a presence in 75 uh, embassies, and I think that's very, very important. I think, uh, from my point of view, ever since 9-11, from a law enforcement point of view and from an intelligent gathering and sharing point of view, I think we're probably locked up as good today as we were uh, and ever, ever before, I think it's, and again, I think um, Secretary Napolitano's effort to try to push that into even more and more of a uh, State Department co-sharing uh, responsibility is, uh, so I think divided government in Washington about foreign policy and domestic policy, yeah, I think it impedes both branches from operating as effectively as they could. Having said that, from a Homeland Security perspective, looking at the global arena, I think it's, uh, it's working pretty well. But it needs, remember I said the first thing you do is you've got to push the border out. You push the border out. And the only way you can push the border out is to buy in and get allies and friends to, who buy into some of the, the things that you want to do. I remember we had a tough time getting a little information from uh, the European Union about travelers coming into the United States. <laughs> Beautiful thing, Secretary Chertoff said, that's a nice start. And again, it's a continuous improvement deal. He went back and said, that's not a bad foundation, but we've got new algorithms, we've got new technology, we need more information. And by the way, after a couple of years you negotiated, they got it. Secretary Napolitano's out there pushing that even further. So uh, I think I'll just reserve my comments and leave it at that. Well, um, when I, I think one of the problems, if, if we think of divided government as separation of powers, um, I do think that the inability of the Congress to reorganize itself to align with the creation of this new department has been a problem. Uh, and it's a problem for a number of reasons. One is uh, the sheer number of, of committees and oversight panels and reports and uh, things that the, the department has to uh, undergo uh, takes a, a lot of time and effort and resources away from, from other work. Um, and in an era when we're talking about flat or decreasing budgets and maximizing and squeezing out of every dollar its highest and best use, uh, I, I will share with you that there are a number of reports we are required by statute to, to prepare, submit in writing, not online, uh, that I, I, I seriously believe are not ever read by anyone, really. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that, that's a problem, the resource uh, demands that that puts on, on the department. And secondly, the fragmentary uh, notion of, of the actual oversight itself. Now, you have the two Homeland Security Committees, and uh, they do a good job. We have a good relationship with, 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 with both of them. Uh, but beyond that, then you've got a committee that all it's looking at is uh, this issue or that issue or this issue and what you miss is that kind of overall strategic oversight and guidance uh, that one would would want out of out of the Congress and so I keep hearing well you can't take up that reorganization Congress it's only Congress can reorganize itself and I would say that is a given but at a certain point in time I would hope there would be the opportunity for some self-reflection in the Congress and for some reorganization uh, in its own terms uh, to, meet, uh, to meet this new department that it has now uh, created. Yeah, real quick, if I might, uh, I think all three of us are in complete agreement that one of the requirements, if you submit a report, is that either the congressman or senator requires a report, the secretary is allowed to give them a test. And if they pass the <laughs> test, 
on the report, they're allowed to uh, ask for another one. And if they don't pass the test, they're barred from asking for a report for a long time. That's a great idea. I'm with you. Well, that, that would do it. <laughs> and secondly, I think, secondly, I think uh, and again, we saw this all the time, uh, I don't know how many times, hundreds of times, I remember testifying that we had Iraq going on and Afghanistan going on, and I was on the Hill more often than uh, uh, since Secretary Rumsfeld. I bet you were on the Hill more often than he was, et cetera. That's the way it works. Thirdly, it's going to require, you talk about divided government. This is a great example. If the Republican and Democrat leaders in the House and the Senate, in that two or three weeks before the next Congress, and I think all three of us, I mean, certainly I think Secretary Chertoff and I would be willing to figure out a way to work with it, would sit down and say, we are going to reorganize now. That's when you have to do it. And by the way, as a member of the House for 12 years, I can remember the lament of my colleagues day after day, walking to the floor, lamenting. I'm on so many committees. I'm on so many subcommittees. Uh, but if you try to take it away from them, uh, it's it, 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 it just, uh, you know, it just, it just doesn't happen. So to require, here's a class, the last question about divided government. Here's where both R's and D's, if they really want to be the strategic partner that secretary needs and the future secretaries need, they really need to, they're down up to 100 plus, aren't they? Oh, 100 okay. plus committees or something? Yeah, it depends on how you, it, it's, wait, it's 108. Well, to, to, in this line of inquiry, uh, seeing that I am retired and my pension is assured, uh, <laughs> I would propose it's time to end random acts of aftersight. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you all for the, those comments. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to go to a lightning round here. I got a lot of questions. Uh, right. Maybe we'll just see who wants to take this one on. Uh, we've all talked a lot about <laughs> cooperation at the state and local level. Uh, and uh, Secretary Napolitano from our, our home state, there have been some local legislative initiatives that uh, posture local law enforcement officers in the role of uh, uh, quasi-enforcement of immigration policy that could be presumed to be a, a federal responsibility. Any insight into as you build this uh, vertically integrated uh, DHS enterprise, uh, what's the best way to move forward and have a discussion about immigration enforcement? Yes, uh, I gave a, a speech last week at American University. It's online, and uh, it, it really talks about uh, uh, immigration enforcement uh, uh, now and uh, what makes for smart and effective in enforcement uh, with a statutory scheme that is more and more out of kilter uh, with the actual needs of the country. Um, but it's, it's a combination of an enforcement stratagems uh, that really allow us to prioritize those that we seek to remove uh, from the country uh, and then uh, encouraging and making as smooth as possible the business practices for legal uh, immigration. Next in the lightning round for Secretary Chertoff. I remember having uh, some really wonderful discussions about this topic. Uh, in light of the decreasing budget environment we're going to be looking at, uh, do you have any thoughts about the Homeland Security Grant Program? And how, <laughs> yeah, this and how is, best, uh, yeah. uh, how best to move forward on that and get the bi biggest return for the money that's available, including looking at uh, leveraging our academic institutions, policy think tanks, and so forth. And I remember standing behind you or with you or and taking those spears that were coming in when you tried to adjust the grant program. Yeah, everybody always, everybody always thought, you know, any grant program that didn't give them all the money and gave it to somebody else was a really deeply <laughs> flawed program. And, uh, people, and the funny thing was there were some communities that would, they would go out and, and in, in the run up to the grant announcement, they'd be poor mouthing themselves. And we're really dangerous. It's really unsafe here. And then the Chamber of Commerce would be going, what are you doing? You're killing the tourist business here? Um, so there was always a little bit of a, of a kind of a schizophrenic attitude to it. Look, this is an area where during my term, I think it was probably true for, for Tom, and I, I don't know if it's still true now with the new budget, we were always, we, the President would submit a budget and the Congress always said, we want to give you more money for grants. I don't ever remember during any of the four budgets I was involved with that Congress said we're happy with it or we're going to cut the budget. Uh, and it is a very popular uh, part of what DHS does for Congress. That being said, look, the purpose of the grant program was to invest, make essentially capital investments, invest in the capabilities that would allow building up a foundation that the state and local governments would then operate. It was not meant to be a payroll subsidy for uh, state and local governments. And I, I think that's really the right approach. There are, frankly, some communities where literally hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions, have been spent. And there is a point at which you would say, you know, 
you've gotten a lot of money. Uh, you've built the basic capabilities. You now have to do the, uh, be engaged in the process of maintaining those. Now, the one qualification I would give is this. There are some areas <clears throat> and some communities where the vulnerability and the threat is um, enhanced because of the fact that what is being served by that community is not just the community itself, but all the surrounding areas. Um, and so the, again, it's this externalities problem. So it is fair, for example, in, in certain of the big cities, particularly have ports and airports, where there's an economic foundation for an entire region, it is fair perhaps to have the federal government chip in something to recognize the fact that the benefit uh, of this is extending not just to the city itself, but to the whole region. But that being said, I think it, you know, in line with this disciplined approach, it is time to look at what's been spent, what has been obtained for the expenditure, and to begin to talk about how you wean some of these communities off what they've begun to treat almost as an entitlement. Secretary Ridge, uh, we've got a question here regarding, uh, this gets back to managing risk that you talked about earlier. There's a lot of focus in the discussion on terrorism. Uh, but as this enterprise has evolved, I think we all would agree through the course of this conversation, we deal with all hazards, all threats. But it's not clearly a diplomatic or a law enforcement issue for DOJ or a DOD event. It's going to come into the Homeland Security enterprise. Uh, can you just comment on the role of the perceived uh, threat of terrorism as it relates to managing that entire portfolio? Well, I think uh, uh, obviously the profile of the terrorist the sanctuaries of the terrorists, the tactics of terrorists, the number of terrorists, it's all changed in the past 10 years. Um, and, but the threat of a terrorist attack has not. And I, one of the things that I think as I look back over the past 10 years is we've proven ourselves to be undeniably a resilient country. You mentioned that word in the, we are a very resilient country. And we will always prepare, uh, hopefully, uh, for a, that, that, big event, that strategic attack like 9-11. But I think now, and Secretary Napolitano could probably comment, but given the fact that the past 18 to 24 months, we've seen more interdictions and arrests of the homegrown type, the citizen, the naturalized citizen, people may be here. So it, it, the scenario really hasn't changed. I think we've demonstrated we're resilient. The professionals are still at it every day. We're no longer breathless, breathless and anxious as we were about it. I think we've got it in the right perspective. So even though bin Laden's dead, Zawahiri's number two. I thought about, when, I mean, how do you go in and deliver the message that Zawahiri, you're number two? The good news is you're number two, you're going from number two to number one, and the bad news is you're in the crosshairs of our special forces, so good luck. So they'll do whatever they want to do over there, but you know, uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, it's Somalia and Yemen, it's the Horn of Africa. And the fact that you're going to have, we're at war against the belief system, an ideology that is perverted an interpretation of a, 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 a historic and profoundly devout religion. And so you're ne we're going to always be at war. Terrorism is a tactic, but we're not war against the tactic. We're a war against those who engage in that tactic to take their perverted interpretation of the Quran, to kill innocents, to advance whatever their cause is. I think we finally got that. And so I just think that we ought to just keep it all in perspective and remind ourselves 300 million people, the borders, no matter what we do, north, south, east, and west, there's still a chance that some will come in, and there's an even better chance that some are already here or can be converted here. Let's just accept that as the new norm, just as this, we accepted the new norm of potential nuclear engagement with the Soviet Union. What did we do? We, we empowered our professionals. We manage that risk, and we let the rest of America go about building a diversified economy, uh, the civil rights movement, the, the digital revolution. It's the new norm. We got it. Homeland Security gets it. And we, just, we, will, we will continue to manage that risk effectively, I believe, even under the most austere budget conditions. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, to continue the discussion on the enterprise approach to these problems at a high level, uh, uh, we got a question regarding the current uh, relationship within the department in the U.S. with Mexico. Mm -hmm. We had the recent uh, paramilitary killings down in Veracruz, and there have been issues from time to time. It spikes, kind of goes away. It's, as we know, it's a ubiquitous uh, problem down there on the border. You want to just give us an update on your current thinking? Well, I think uh, uh, we've been in, in, engaged in very vigorous efforts with the Calderon administration uh, to, to deal with particularly the, the cartels in Mexico. 
Um, and, and that's a homeland security issue in part because those cartels all have fingers that reach into virtually every state of, of the United States. Uh, and it's also important because uh, you don't want the rule of law lost in uh, particularly the northern states of Mexico. And there has been some danger of that over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, progress is being made. Uh, some of the, the, the leaders have now been uh, uh, captured or, or killed. Um, but uh, I think that our relationships uh, with Mexico, they're heading into their own presidential election cycle. Uh, this, this, is, this is why Homeland Security is, is such a complex field, because uh, you've, you've got to deal with managing that relationship, uh, keeping that southern border secure, and at the same time making sure that the ports are open and commerce is flowing freely uh, between, uh, between Mexico and the United States. Why? Because there are literally hundreds of thousands of jobs that, that depend on it. And striking that balance, getting it right, and working uh, with the government of Mexico, it all has to be done simultaneously. Well, let me thank you all for your participation. Let me close with one question, because we were talking about uh, the role of the private sector and how we solve these large, complex going, problems going forward. We had a pretty in-depth and robust discussion on cybersecurity issues, and I think it's pretty clear that uh, there's a consensus in this panel about the uh, uh, preferred way forward on that. Maybe we just go through each, each one of you and talk about another problem not related to cybersecurity. Uh, where there may be a budding technology or a solution out there that's not necessarily going to reside in government that could serve as a basis for some broader discussion beyond cybersecurity, another tough problem we're working that's going to, going to require the private sector to help. Um, I, well, I think uh, one, one area is in the whole area of diagnostics um, and the ability uh, to uh, be able to uh, monitor and diagnose uh, if, for example, there is a biologic agent introduced in, into the atmosphere very quickly uh, with appropriate um, uh, mitigation uh, processes and, and things available for that. So I think the whole area of diagnostics is is, is very ripe one. I, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a cliche now, but, you know, the issue of big data and, and analytics. We have, we collect a huge amount of data. It's video. We get uh, the stuff on now on Facebook and open source social networking. Uh, there's information we collect at the borders, all kinds of things. And the ability to unify it, bring it together, manage it, and, and do so in real time, I think is, is a huge challenge now. And it's one in which I think the private sector has a lot of interesting capabilities uh, to bring together. Yeah, the technology of detection, I think, covers both. Predictive analytics, based on what you know, based on the data that you have. Also, the technology is this, uh, uh, are these spores uh, pathogens we ought to worry about? Are they contagious? Uh, nuclear uh, material, radiological detection. So I think the technology of detection uh, covers in many, uh, many areas, and I think that's where the private sector, whether it is the analytical piece, uh, based on the data information and that kind of uh, algorithms and how you write those up to the technology of detection that Secretary DiPolitano was. That's a, a, a great place uh, for the uh, private sector to operate. Thanks. I think that's a great way to close, especially with the, uh, the folks we have represented here in the audience today. Let me just uh, restate what I, what I said at the beginning. Um, it's been a, a journey and an evolution and a maturation of the department, uh, having had the opportunity to be there at the startup and with the transition team and work for all three of you has been a distinct honor and a pleasure for me in my, in my personal and professional life. And I want to thank you all for your leadership that uh, not only that you display now, Secretary Napolitano, but Secretary Chertoff and Secretary Ridge, you continue to do in your, in your private uh, practices and everything you're doing there. It's a, it's a great model for the con uh, country, and we thank you for being here this no, evening. And thank can I say all. on behalf yeah. of all of us, uh, we thank you for your service, that you've been uh, not only a superb commandant and, a, and Coast Guard leader, but you've also, from the department standpoint, been really... Um, at the, at the hub of standing up and building a department which bears a lot of your DNA. So, so I think I speak for all of us in thanking you. Thank you all. Thank you for being here.